Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can find us at nationalartsclub.org or you can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Writing the Future, Basquiat and the Hip Hop Generation, featuring three of the book's authors, Boston Museum of Fine Arts curator Liz Monsell, critic, writer, and musician Greg Tate, and award-winning performance artist and professor Johanna Faith Almiron. The event will be moderated by Sarah Douglas, the Editor-in-Chief of Art News. Thank you, Sarah. Writing the Future can be purchased from our preferred independent bookseller, Books on Call, via a link we'll be sharing in the chat during the event. Following the discussion will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And before I turn it over to Sarah, we'd like to briefly plug our current exhibition, which is actually opening tonight, uh, entitled Voices of the Soho Renaissance, which is a landmark exhibition that brings together works created by the artist collective Soho Renaissance Factory. And it's the first presentation of works born out of calls for social justice in the aftermath of the city's lockdown and the following Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we'll be sharing more information about that exhibition in the chat as well. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Sarah. Please enjoy the program. Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to give you a little more uh, detail on our participants here um, in terms of their bios. Uh, Liz Munsell is Curator of Contemporary Art at the MFA Boston where she's organized dozens of exhibitions and new commissions with emerging and overlooked artists. She established the MFA's first performance art program and has worked to bring increased diversity to the museum's collections, exhibitions, and programs. Between 2012 and 2017, Monsell held a visiting curator post at Harvard University's David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. She's currently a member of the Board of Advisors to the Cisneros Fontenelles Art Foundation. Her writings have been published in print and online publications, such as MoMA's Post Notes on Modern and Contemporary Art Around the Globe and Artforum.com. Joanna Faith Almiron is an independent scholar and cultural critic. Her forthcoming manuscript, which is very pertinent to our talk today, offers a groundbreaking portrait of Jean-Michel Basquiat's radical imagination. Her critical essays have appeared in the LA Review of Books, Hyperallergic, Lit Hub, and galleries and museums, including the Guggenheim, MFA Boston, Queensland Gallery of Modern Art. She's taught cultural studies and visual culture at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University, and the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And Greg Tate, who I'm proud to say has been a contributor to Art News. Um, is a musician and writer. He was staff writer for The Village Voice from 1987 to 2005. His work has been published in the New York Times, The Washington Post, Art Forum, Downbeat, Essence, Jazz Times, Rolling Stone, and Vibe. The source described him as one of the godfathers of hip hop journalism, also very pertinent to our talk today. In 1999, he established Burnt Sugar, an improvisational ensemble that varies in size between 13 and 35 musicians. He's been a visiting professor of Africana Studies at Brown University and the Louis Armstrong Visiting Professor at Columbia University Center for Jazz Studies. I'll just mention a couple of his books, Flyboy in the Buttermilk, Essays on Contemporary America, and Everything But the Burden, What White People Are Taking from Black Culture. And now I would like to dive in, um, first of all, by saying uh, this is uh, of all the exhibitions that I've been reading about in this very strange year. This is uh, one of one of probably the five that I was dying to see in person, um, which I've been, you know, pretty much 
staying put. So I haven't seen any exhibitions. <laughs> I probably saw uh, Cindy Sherman at Metro Pictures, the one exhibition I've seen since March, which is a tragedy for the editor of an art magazine. But this exhibition, which I'll just um, say has been described by um, the Washington Post as, uh, and this is impressive, it already feels like the most important exhibition on Basquiat you'll ever see. And he's just one artist among the show's dozen. And to me, that really captures the spirit of this show um, insofar as, and I can tell you this from pouring over the catalog, it really does make a huge, you know, I'm not the first person to say this sort of myth busting contribution to the conversation around Basquiat while not being a monographic exhibition. It is very much uh, putting him in the context of, I think this was also in the, uh, in the Globe article, but I love this, his friends and stuff. Um, anyhow, I want to hand it over as quickly as possible to our panelists. And I just want to start out sort of on that note, because I'm assuming that of the hundreds of people listening to us here, we probably only have a handful of Basquiat experts. Um, and maybe they're the only, only the people in this room. So I want to hear from you, uh, Liz and Greg, about what you feel is this exhibition's biggest contribution, its biggest difference from the context in which we've seen Basquiat in the past. And, you know, maybe in order to do that, you can tell us a little bit about how we have, see, you know, seen Basquiat in the past in terms of how he has been presented to us. Who wants to go first? Liz, I'll, I'll hand it over to you first. Sure, and as I answer, I'll try to share my my screen get you some images as well hope everyone can see that so this is the first museum exhibition to contextualize Basquiat's work uh, with his friends his peers of color who uh, were also creating work on the streets um, either the subways or the city walls in the 1970s and who together decided to transition their work into the contemporary gallery scene um, in the very late 70s and early 80s as part of uh, what we call one of the most um, important but really overlooked movements in contemporary art history that is post graffiti art. And uh, the exhibition really is set up um, to introduce the idea, uh, the backdrop um, of this story, which is of course the graffiti era of the 1970s that unfolded uh, with the backdrop of uh, New York City's economic collapse, um, which provided uh, cheap rent uh, in downtown and um, a really energetic artistic scene that was rooted in post-punk um, that very quickly um, in the 80s became one of the first sites of convergence for hip hop culture um, downtown. Um, hip hop came from the outer boroughs um, and street corners and found this home. Um, they were great bedfellows with uh, the, uh, the post-punk scene that emerged there. Um, maybe Greg wants to jump in here and tell us a little bit about the image that, um, that very much introduces the exhibition. Oh, you got to unmute, Greg. And I got to mute. <laughs> Um, this is the entrance uh, to the exhibition, and um, those who know the New York subways will recognize the yellow line on the stairwell that's not normally there. Um, the uh, designer, uh, the designers of the exhibition uh, picked up on a conversation I had with Liz the first time I went down into the space and said, wow, this reminds me of coming down into the underground, the New York underground you know, uh, onto the platforms, you know, and uh, they took that and ran with it. Uh, you'll see the the pillars of a subway station uh, down at the end of the hall. And uh, you'll also see um, Fab Five, Freddy's famous uh, soup can, Campbell soup train, um, his uh, nod um, to uh, Andy Warhol and to the art world, you know, from the trains. And um, it really speaks to um, um, this moment when um, some of the writers um, of uh, 
what's called graffiti, um, were thinking about, you know, making this move, um, kind of busting into uh, the downtown uh, gallery scene. It's an energetic moment. And what we wanted to do with an immersive installation like this, which includes, to get some sound into the picture, uh, a 22 foot wide uh, projection of um, clips from the first documentary on hip hop culture uh, by um, the photographer and filmmaker Henry, Henry Chalfant and Tony Silver. Um, so this and the soundtrack is of course um, Beat Bop, which is the track uh, for which Jean-Michel Basquiat serves as the producer. He's really uh, the concept driver of this track. He invites many of his friends, um, some of them who are in the show, um, Al Diaz, for example, uh, who is his partner in Samo, his, his venture on the, on the streets and city walls, um, his identity, his uh, tag, uh, as it has been called. Uh, Al plays percussion on this track, and it becomes one of the most important tracks in hip hop history. So already from the beginning of the show, we're very much um, highlighting Jean-Michel as a multidisciplinary artist. Um, here is also an image of, of uh, his work as Samo, um, and a multidisciplinary artist, not just a painter, um, but somebody who is deeply embedded in this anything goes DIY culture, which of course involves experimenting across um, disciplinary bounds. Yeah. And when we talk about myth busting uh, aspects to the show, one is that um, Jean Michel was, <laughs> ironically, literally, the the only graffiti writer um, in the show in terms of actually writing on walls. But in terms of that movement of uh, painting uh, and calligraphy that took place on the trains, he was not a part of that. He never went underground. Um, spent hours. Um, throwing up a masterpiece on the side of a subway car. But in a lot of writing about him um, uh, in terms of uh, mainstream press, he's usually not referred to as a painter, but as the graffiti writer, Jean-Michel Basquiat, when in fact um, his career is in fact built on uh, painting, you know, um, that's specifically directed um, towards the white cube, you know, uh, towards the, the galleries of uh, Soho. Well, I, I, I also wanted to bring up, I, I don't want to get too far away from the soundtrack yet, because is it safe to say this is the first Basquiat exhibition that has music playing in the galleries, um, first of all? And secondly, I do want to hear a little bit, Greg, about how you put that uh, together, because one of the points that's made throughout the catalog is that, you know, when you're talking about the era of hip hop, it wasn't just hip hop you had a bunch of different genres of music that, you know, people sometimes think of as, you know, oppositional or, you know, I'm thinking of punk, for instance. Um, and, and how did you kind of try to capture that spirit in what in the soundtrack that you put together? All right, well, this, this is where it gets interesting to um, kind of nuance um, the whole definition of hip hop, right? Because there's an aspect of it that is, of course, DJing. And um, the early DJs um, would draw what was called a breakbeat, you know, a loop of um, kind of the, 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 the most, the, the funkiest dance, you know, percussive drum portion of a record um, from a range of musics. And um, they were quite um, diverse in terms of their, their uh, sound sources. Um, so that's, that's, that's one point. But the other is that um, when um, I was putting together the soundtrack, I was thinking specifically of what, I, what I'd heard about Jean-Michel's studio practice, that he kept um, Charlie, you know, bebop going night and day, you know, um, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, uh, Thelonious Monk, Charles Mingus, uh, Max Roach, those folks. And he, of course, he also made several paintings um, that were about identifying these figures as his kind of personal pantheon as, as uh, in terms of being uh, icons and uh, royalty of the streets. You know, he was asked once what his subject matter was. He said, royalty, heroism, and the streets. So um, that music, you know, it, it, it had a literal place in terms of 
who he was representing, you know, as heroic, as iconic in the work, but it was also sonic inspiration as well. Um, so if the soundtrack uh, we put together for the gallery, which is on uh, Spotify, you know, it has all of those figures uh, I mentioned. It also has um, some early hip hop of the day of, of the early eighties, uh, Curtis Blow and Run DMC. And then it's also got, um, you know, uh, punk represented as well, X-Ray Specs and uh, the Pretenders and uh, Bad Brains, right? Um, and in terms of it, I, you know, I, of course, I can't say that it's, it's the first exhibition of, of uh, work by Basquiat that has a, uh, a soundtrack running through the galleries because I think many of the, the shows I've seen have tried to represent um, some of the multidisciplinary aspects of the um, uh, of 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 his practice and the other artists um, in the show's practice, but um, I think you know I don't know if any actually have a dedicated soundtrack that you will hear um, throughout uh, running throughout um, your your um, your visit to uh, all all seven of our of our uh, galleries. Yeah, well, I also want to, I do want, and Liz, maybe you can mention some of the exhibitions that presaged this approach to looking at Basquiat as a multi multidisciplinary artist, rather. Yeah, so we, we wanted music to be as present in the galleries as the paintings hanging on the walls. Um, so the soundtrack is something that you experience as you're moving through the entire space, as Greg mentioned. Um, I would, I'd be willing to bet some money on that where the first Basquiat, uh, it's really a group exhibition, of course, um, but uh, where the first Basquiat exhibition to do that, I would say we are. Um, Greg and I were definitely building off of a wonderful exhibition that, that we saw together um, in Frankfurt that had traveled um, from the Barbican uh, in London. And it was, um, it was curated um, by a wonderful uh, curator, Eleanor Nan, who had very much for, I, I believe the first time, uh, emphasized the performance aspects of Jean-Michel's practice. Um, and so it was, in my view, um, a, a more complete retrospective um, than what ha he had been afforded uh, in the past. And that exhibition took place in 2019, if I'm, if, uh, 18, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And Greg gave a wonderful talk for it um, when it traveled to Frankfurt, um, to the Schoen. And I guess the other thing I could add in terms of past uh, myth busting and past exhibitions, um, there's a few things that this exhibition is not, you know, despite the Basquiat's name being in the title, it's not a solo show. It's absolutely a group exhibition that contextualizes Jean-Michel's work alongside that of his friends. Um, and then it's it's also, you know, very much not meant to be, um, uh, let me show uh, kind of like a powerhouse, let me show as many bo possible Basquiat's as I can find. Um, it's a very focused story and we needed very specific works um, in order to contextualize him and, um, kind of focus in on the fact that he's often been painted as the sole black genius painter of the era, for example, or, you know, Andy Warhol's friend. Um, and all of that absolutely erases um, his influence, the influence of, of his peer artists of color and his community, um, which consisted of other artists who were very much uh, pushing into the gallery system alongside him. And he was, a part of that we discovered through the research and he was also supporting his fellow artists um, in, in their own efforts uh, towards their careers. And, and before we move on to, I, I wanna talk about uh, Joanna's essay um, in, in particular in the catalog. Um, I wanna just ask about, you know, these, these artists who were in his orbit, um, what, you know, when we look in particular at someone like Ramel Z, where you have this this photo up right now, um, what what emerges 
um, about Basquiat when we look at him in the context of, for instance, someone like Ramel Z, who's not, not maybe as well known, but who emerges as a real protagonist, I think, in this exhibition? Well, I mean, all of these artists, um, I mean, they're part of a movement and a generational momentum uh, to make work that came off the train. So they're representing hundreds of, of New York kids who every night, you know, went out and um, bombed, you know, and tagged uh, and painted on the, um, the cars of the, uh, the New York subway, subway system, you know, the A, B, C, D, N, R, Q, K, one, two, three, four, five, and six trains, you know, um, they all got hit uh, by this, this generational wave. And um, in a sense, these artists kind of represent um, what happened when um, hip hop became, it kind of insinuated itself into the downtown club scene. I mean, the thing that we, we tried to give a sense of in the show is like, um, just, just the, the importance uh, or the significance or the, the, the prevalence of night clubbing, you know, in the era, you know, because that's where, you know, all of the, uh, the exchange uh, that wasn't on the walls uh, went down, you know, on a nightly basis. And there were amazing bands playing every night. And um, you get a sense of this from the film Downtown 81, um, which was kind of made in there, but not released, uh, um, I think until 2000. You know, uh, but um, um, but you know there was there was so much just creative energy and ferment, you know, going on at the time, um, you know, in the streets, in the clubs, you know, and um, and also in in you know some of the underground uh, gallery situations as well. And in fact, in the in the um, catalog, you know, Ramel Z has a great comment he makes to the effect that the transit system, you know, is, the, is in fact the biggest gallery uh, you can have in terms of the distribution uh, of your work. Um, right. Well, uh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going over to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing that's interesting about Ram LZ, I mean, there's so many things that are interesting uh, to say about Ram LZ, but, um, you know, he's one of these artists that um, really was not interested in breaking into the gallery scene. He thought that their, his, his um, group's most important work um, was the work they were doing on the trains, that they had actually uh, begun a, a kind of war against the kind of sterility um, and the corruption of, of art institutions. Um, and um, they had actually created a, a movement that didn't need that kind of legitimacy. Um, but um, yeah, it's no question if, if, if you go to the work of um, the photographers, Henry Chalfont and uh, Martha Cooper, um, they documented hundreds, if, if not even maybe thousands of these works on the train that were seen every day, you know, by the strap hangers as they, you know, gathered on the elevated train platforms in the morning in particular. And um, the work was literally seen citywide, you know what I mean? Probably seen more than um, most of the work that was inside of the, the you know, the major uh, galleries and museums of the city on a daily basis. Sorry, I want to remind our audience that you can uh, put questions into the chat and we will address them during the Q&A, so I would encourage that. Um, I want to um, move on a, a little bit. Um, Joanna, I, I was really, um, reading your essay in the catalog um, thinking of, and thinking about you know the the this exhibition being on during a year in which you know there was so much action on the social justice front and obviously spurred on by a very tragic event um, in fact uh, Baz Kiat engaged with uh, these issues and in particular, um, I think around Michael Stewart, an, an artist who was uh, killed by police during that time. Um, and I wondered if you can talk a little bit about um, the kind of, you know, social consciousness of, of Basquiat's work a little bit. Sure. 
Thank you. And I just want to give a shout out to everybody that's here, both in the audience. Like I know that I have family on the other coast, uh, former students, and just like a whole lot of folks. Um, and I also just wanted to thank you and the organizers of the panel um, for putting this together. But I also have to do, sorry, this is just custom. <laughs> um, I also just have to say thank you, thank you, thank you um, to my Jedi, um, Greg Tate, uh, for inviting me to write for this catalog. And he is the first to invite me um, to write for a catalog. He opened the door for me and um, in this very real way in terms of like uh, in attempts to become a professional writer when you have a writer hold the door for you um, and especially one that means so much to you. Um, it's, it's just been such an honor. And, as, and after he invited me, then the, the Guggenheim came and um, Queensland and um, other catalogs. But I just want to note that Greg has been there since the beginning of my research in, as a Basquiat scholar. <clears throat> and I'm talking about like University of Hawaii um, doctoral dissertation. Like he's, um, uh, we've had conversations. Um, he's been there for my first presentation. So I just wanted to, um, honor um, the genealogy um, that I can proudly claim as a part of his um, pay it forward alumnus. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to first say that. Um, and then if I could just, before I jump into um, the topic that you mentioned, I also wanted to just uh, respond to some of the questions or the topics that have been brought up. Um, and like when I think about, um, oh, and speaking of Greg, so the, um, although I, I would probably argue that um, uh, Basquiat's, uh, Basquiat's uh, first exhibition with music would be the fun gallery or um, thinking about the ways that um, they would transform clubs into galleries and how music was um, in, um, integral to art making. And even thinking about um, the music that Basquiat paints from Charlie Parker, um, to Miles Davis that like, you don't actually go to see Basquiat without hearing music, like in the actual painting. I think that's one of the things that's so genius about him is that you can feel the music when you're looking at it. Um, and that, um, <clears throat> and so I would, I, so I would just say that like, in terms of how music is in, incorporated into it, but even though that's the case that music is, has been a part of his, um, the, his exhibitionary um, history. I would say that the playlist that Greg Tate curates is its own work of art. And this is somebody who has studied um, music and has and has his own um, and is a musician himself, but has interviewed, I mean, his most infamous, sorry, this be, <laughs> you know, he, he was able to land a, an interview with Sade, Mo moment of silence for her next album. <laughs> So, so I'm just saying that like for somebody who as who is as well listened to um, and well and and one of the scholars of Basquiat's work um, to have his um, his high taste level um, curate a, um, a, a soundtrack that it, that is in it of itself groundbreaking and I'm just going to do a big shout out so speaking of which okay I'm going to have to Shout out to Rich Naples of, uh, um, if you need a cool Zoom, go to the Smithsonian. <laughs> okay, wait, ah, uh, sorry. Okay, so um, this is like for the Basquiat heads who are trying to figure out like where to start. Um, I would just say that this particular, um, this show, oh, this show, um, and then this article, oh my gosh, sorry. This is like becoming story time, my bad. Okay, um, anyway, um, this particular essay, Black Like Bee um, by Greg Tate, totally rocked my world and changed my way of understanding art history as it's written. And um, and is I would that, say- is that, that, is that the Whitney catalog? This is the Whitney catalog, sorry, yes. Basquiat's first retrospective. Um, and it is of course uh, only his second museum solo exhibition. Um, he only had one uh, during his lifetime, but please continue, Joe. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, 
was, what else was I going to say? Oh, yes. So I was just going to say that, um, you know, it, like there's nothing like playing Biggie when you're crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. There's nothing like playing The Roots when you're in Philadelphia. Listen, if, if you're looking at Basquiat's work, check out the Spotify playlist. And I've been a part of exhibitions like I know the Guggenheim had um, Batiste do a, um, a uh, a playlist there. And I remember at the Barbican, they were playing music as well. But the, the genius behind Greg's um, curation is that it, it it's like he has manteca on it. So that's like arroz con pollo. You know, that it's like, you're gonna actually party with Basquiat if you're listening to the music while looking at his art. So that's just my plug in terms of like the music <laughs> question. Stop um, making stop making me blush, man. I want to hear you. I want to hear, hear you talk about <laughs> Basquiat's pain. Yeah, but I'm just saying that like the foundation. This is foundational to me, um, and also gives you a greater appreciation of the book itself. But we also love you, and why not give you the, your flowers today? Because now's the time. And now let's talk about your essay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please, please. Um, so I know that, so in terms of the social consciousness of Basquiat's work and particularly thinking about Ram LZ, I just think of, um, I would, um, without doing like any close reading of the actual paintings, I would just say that so much of my project in terms of growing the scholarship around Basquiat is about foregrounding and illuminating the genius of our youth, the genius of our black and brown youth who are the ones who are moving the needle towards a better tomorrow. And even in uh, even thinking about, and, and, and the ones who are brave enough to be rebels, the ones who are brave enough to not just be cogs in the wheel, um, you know, uh, that, that is Radmel Z Basquiat. And I have to shout out Al Albert Diaz, Al Diaz. Um, and uh, here is, this is, oh, sorry. One back. Okay. So, um, and, and I would also just say that, that um, yes, um, Basquiat, he, he addresses police brutality, um, something that is not 2020. It is closer to like 1400. It's like closer to 1800. It's like the, the notion that um, police brutality and the ways that youth have organized to um, to assert their right to exist um, is a long time, it, um, uh, is, is a problem as old, um, is older than, um, than we should be proud of. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, but I wanted to show these two pictures because um, I also just wanted to shout out, um, if you're interested in, uh, um, in understanding the beginnings of Basquiat's um, work as a street artist and as um, uh, this, I would say, is the definitive book on the history of Samo. Um, and that particular uh, um, photo is uh, from 1978 and by Natalia Masistrenko. So I just wanted to give credit there. And then um, the photo next to it, Samo for you, says, I love the old decaying and yet to be renovated stations like Bowery on the J line. So, um, and this goes back, actually ties back to Sarah's question about social consciousness. So two hours after the election, and we're here, like, this is like four or five, four years later, right? For, and a decade. Um, uh, um, Al Diaz decided to revive Samo. So when we think about how is Basquiat's work still relevant, I would say, especially within the, the, the verve and um, the defiance of hip hop's existence, and not just existence, but like its statement, um, I think about Al and I think about how um, he continues to push us um, as a society to think about the least amongst us and the most vulnerable, but he's also a ton of fun. Like I'm never with him where I'm not laughing at the mundane and the absurdity of the mundane. Um, I also, in, when we had a conversation, Joanna, you talked a lot about how, and I thought this was so interesting, how Al Diaz helped Basquiat shape his, you know, at least in his writing, how he, how he would present himself. 
I thought that was very interesting. And, you know, for people who don't know, Al Diaz, I guess you would say, was one half of Samo in Bosquet's early days when he was writing Samo uh, on the walls around uh, downtown New York. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, I feel like... And they knew each other from high school, right? Yes, they knew each other from high school. They collaborated on... Um, like the school newspaper together. They created their own newspaper. Um, and this was the funny story I was trying to tell you before. So I'm just gonna let you kind of see this. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's um, there's a, a space, it's supposed to be like a subway. And there's a moment where he says, Jean the Bohemian, like right here. And this is what Al has to say about that. He says, Jean was never involved in the name slash number graffiti culture of the 1970s like I was. He may have been somewhat sheltered from street culture during his preteen years. I remember he made an illustration for the um, CAS Basement Blues Press, the school paper that we founded together, and drew an interior of a subway car covered with graffiti. He added his own tag, Jean the Bohemian, revealing to me that he definitely did not quite get the whole graffiti vibe. <laughs> Samo was different though. So, um, so yes, so I feel like he definitely was the person who introduced him or, or I shouldn't say introduced, but um, was an ambassador for the culture of which Al was very much a part of. He, Al, Al, on the other hand, was doing numbers, was doing cars, was doing buildings. Um, sorry, Liz, can you just um, uh, go back one more again? Yes, okay, so one more thing I'm just gonna say quickly about Samo for you, um, especially for those of you who hunt for graffiti sightings. This same Samo for you is um, now a mural um, on, the roof, on the roof of, um, not the rooftop, but up, up high above um, City S School, um, the one that's in um, Manhattan now, not in Brooklyn, it used to be. But um, so Samo for you, I think is also just like a beautiful statement. Um, it reminds me of um, Muhammad Ali's Me and We poem, the idea that Samo is about, about the everyday people. Um, I, okay. and I just wanted to bring up one more thing and I'm sorry to, to keep bringing you back to your essay, but I was very <laughs> impressed by it. If you could talk just for a moment about Basquiat's depictions of policemen in his paintings. Sure, um, so there is, um, I don't know, Liz, if you can help me find the Lahara, L-A-H-A-R-A. So um, there's a, what's that? We didn't add it since we kind of read. Yes, yes. Um, sure. So the, um, with, let me find. Um, so I would say there are several pieces of, um, There's actually one of from the newspaper from that he did when he it was like 1979 I think it was. Um, so there are different um, um, uh, portraits of the police that he's done. Um, the exhibition at the Guggenheim um, Basquiat's defacement was um, oh I have it right here okay. Mm. So Lahara is like, uh, I'm just going to do a quick, uh, a quick um, uh, sharing about it. Um, he would present um, the policemen as monsters and uh, Lahara is uh, slang for, uh, for O'Hara, like the uh, um, Irish policeman. So like if the policemen were coming, they would say Lahara, Lahara, Lahara. <laughs> And, um, and so that is the name of this particular piece. Um, and then he also did um, uh, this, I would say this is more well-known um, and also a masterwork, uh, The Irony of Negro Policemen. Um, and all of these paintings, um, the, uh, um, both Lahara as well as um, Irony, were done in 1981, and this was around the same time as um, as uh, when um, chokeholds, or that was 82. Sorry, um, I'm just going. To, I don't want to, to um, take up too much space, so I'm I am going to refer folks to the book. 
for a, a closer reading on everything. But um, but I will just say that um, you know he sent a picture of a gun to um, Edgar J. Hoover when he was in third grade. <laughs> and I would say that was probably his first documented performance art piece. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I would just say that he has always been, and as um, like a post-colonial Afro-Atlantic diasporic subject I, um, who had um, spent time in schools in Puerto Rico, as well as schools throughout New York, um, that he had a very keen understanding of, of, of how overdetermined colonial education and curriculum can be. And in the same way that he challenged the authority of, say, history throughout his work, I think he also challenged um, the authority of the state and the ways that um, they enforced that. But, I, but both Ramel Z um, and Basquiat uh, were harassed by the police. Um, not unlike um, uh, uh, young people who, who look like them now. Um, and so I would just say that his work continues in relevance because of um, the ways, of, because of the deep, the deep love for humanity that he expresses throughout his work. To, I want to talk about, um, we've seen, all of these great uh, installation views, and I want to maybe come back to those a little bit. Um, Greg, I really wanted to talk about your involvement with sort of, and and I know that um, I know that Makiba McCreary was a big part of this, but bringing this exhibition to um, you know various communities in Boston and and kind of not to say interpreting it, but, and I, I, I feel like the word accessible is being overused and it's getting um, to the point where one doesn't want to use it. But anyhow, to, to, to try to um, bring in audiences to this exhibition, I, I feel like there was a real effort in the case of this show to do that in a way that involved the city in an, in an active way. And so I, I want to hear you, obviously we, we don't have Mahima McCreary here, but I, I hope that you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, um, Mahima McCreary is uh, Liz's colleague at the museum and um, is her official title uh, Director of Public Programming or Community Outreach? Um, I actually wrote down her title. Her title is the Chief um, of Chief of Learning and Community Engagement. And she was appointed to that role in 2018. So it's a relatively new position at the museum. Well, in terms of our exhibition, I mean, her, her contribution has been essential in um, insofar as bringing uh, the Black and Latinx community into conversation with Liz and myself uh, about the exhibition before, uh, while it was, it was still uh, being brought to, completion in terms of um, of uh, curation and obtaining works and so forth. And, you know, we we learned a lot from an engagement with the uh, the folks that Makiba uh, brought in who were uh, part of um, Boston's uh, hip hop community and activist community and uh, business community. Um, and these were all people who were kind of spanned, you know, um, the long view idea of a hip hop generation, uh, folks, young artists in their 20s, other people who worked in um, finance and, you know, people who were involved with Black Lives Matter, as well as like veteran um, uh, 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 street artists, you know, and, and, and painters as well, like uh, our friend Rob Stull, who we're seeing on the screen now, and uh, uh, the artist Pro Black, whose piece you're seeing. Um, uh, now, which is just outside of the last gallery. And this is a mural um, that a uh, pro black did that's, uh, you know, on site as well. Oh, this, this, this is, is this on site at the museum, Liz? No, this is just yeah. down the street about a mile away. In okay, yeah. Roxbury, where I'm sitting right now, which is yeah. a um, yeah. black neighborhood. And it's really, it's the MFA's neighbor, um, okay. yeah not been um it's not been treated as such uh so this is this mural kind of is a community uh arm 
um, into the neighborhood of, of Roxbury. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you know, almost to a person, everybody that was brought in for these sessions, you know, talked about um, never expecting to see anything um, like this show, you know, honoring um, these artists and this culture, um, you know, within the, you know, within the, um, you know, on the walls, you know, and within the institution. And so it really spoke to um, uh, the sense of alienation and distance that existed between this vibrant community of artists um, who'd always been there, who'd been making a difference, um, you know, uh, creatively and politically and spiritually in Boston and the MFA itself, you know. And um, when I, the last time I was in Boston, I was asking uh, Makiba how the, the reopening was going and the, um, the attendance. And she said it was something like 2,000 people a day, which uh, she said was down from the pre-COVID 10,000. But I said, yeah, that's still pretty remarkable for this time. You know, I mean, I know people who haven't come out of their their homes since March. So the fact that you got people to come into a museum with other folks to see work is 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 pretty telling in itself. You know, um, uh, but you know, in terms of being that bridge um, to this show. You know uh, what Liz and I were trying to attempt, and an actual community. I mean, you know, uh, Makiba is essential and central to that. I, I wanted. I, I was. I, I was going to talk to you guys about what it was like to work on an exhibition like this during COVID, because I'm personally very interested in that. But I want to ask something else instead, which is that when I'm reading the catalog, you know, not having seen the show, so much of this catalog is about. I mean, it does have a little bit of a, you had to be there undercurrent. Like, you know, when Carla McCormick, who has an essay in there, talks about, and he's not the only person, talks about, you know, you kind of come out of this period of minimalism in New York, and then suddenly you have, you know, the, the art that Basquiat and his circle and Herring and the clubs and the music and the subways, and it was about movement and energy and music and, you know, I'm kind of thinking, how, is there a frustration when you get to the museum part of it where you're like, I can't turn this museum into a club. Like I can't, it, 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 can you truly create that immersive experience? Like do you, in trying to do a show like this, do you ru really run up against the limits of, you know, the white cube? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, um credit and addressing that is really um, owed to our exhibition designer, um, Chelsea Garunai and our graphic designer, Nick Pioggio, who um, absolutely transformed the space and were responsible for working through with, with Greg and I, the look of it, which, you know, from the beginning we talked about, um, you know, the, sorry, I'm kind of playing MC and DJ at this point. <laughs> show you know this immersive environment um, that we created in order to show the scale uh, that these very young artists who created as we mentioned the largest circuit for uh, distributing ones art quite possibly ever imagined in the history of art their their audacity um, and ambition um, in taking over the subway train and and city walls as 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 Basquiat did as well so that kind of immersive context is what we wanted to to start with and then you know as soon as you get inside the gallery you know that it's a white cube space and it's not a show that is about graffiti uh, or graffiti culture. That is absolutely the kind of bedrock foundation of it, but it's a post graffiti show. This work has migrated onto canvas and into uh, the white cube space. And you know that through, you know, the, the, the seemingly fluorescent lighting um, and the gray uh, concrete floor and, and the white walls. Um, and then, you know, um, very much, through to the, the portraiture gallery, which introduces, this is the only gallery in the exhibition that is um, all Basquiat in every other room, um, all seven of the rooms. We wanted to ensure that Basquiat's work could be seen alongside his peers, the other 11 artists in the show, 
people like Fab Five Freddy, Eero, A1, Rem LZ, who we've spoken about. Um, but this room, the portraiture room, is all Jean-Michel, and it serves as a mode of introducing who the other artists in the exhibition are. So, um, and it was his intention, the reason why he said he painted um, black figures is because he did not see them hanging in the walls of modern art museums. Uh, and, and he wanted to um, create a, a mode of, of um, being a protagonist of this experience. And so we wanted through this gallery, the portraiture gallery, uh, which highlights people like Eero A1 and all, almost all the other artists of the show, I mean, he painted the portrait of almost all the artists in the exhibition, thereby inserting them into this art history. Um, so in this portraiture gallery, we did want it to feel like a, uh, a museum context, a, a, white, a white box um, gallery. But then when you move into the next room, which is about writing and the foundation of the tag, um, the development of an individual artistic style that begins with um, this act of writing one's name and abstracting it in a mode that makes it, you know, your recognizable style. Uh, we, we just, we went back to kind of an immersive context um, and spotlit so that you could focus in on the individual artists and their individual styles, you know, works like Lady Pink's um, with, uh, with her bubble lettering going up the side of a building or um, Fab Five Freddy. And then certainly this wonderful uh, 13 foot um, canvas by Eero, which is his most monumental surviving work flanked by two uh, columns uh, by Keith Haring in LA too. So I think the, the exhibition design is essential. And then certainly um, the works themselves uh, move you and in, in the space um, are so powerful to engage with it. I think it, it, it does infuse you with, with some of the energy of, of the moment. And that's really different than looking at them on the screen, I can promise you. I mean, when I was away, after being away from the museum for six months and coming back to install this exhibition, uh, and I was, um, you know, confronted with a, a, a Jean-Michel Bassia that we were uncrating, and I saw those layers of paint uh, and, and the marking where he took the oil stick to the, to the wet paint and revealed all the layers underneath, like, there's nothing like it. It's just, um, it is a, a visceral experience. And I think that you feel that in the space of the exhibition. Yeah, and, I, and because we, we've done, um, you know, uh, walks and tours with um, uh, some of the people that Makiba uh, brought into, um, into conversation with us, um, you've seen them kind of struck by a certain kind of shock and awe in seeing these works within the museum context. And, you know, one of the things, you know, of course there are limits to um, uh, museums in terms of their, um, their institutional uh, authority, authority uh, and uh, imprimatur. And, um, you know, I feel like we're weaponizing um, the legitimacy of the museum as a space by placing these works and this culture in here in, in such a, um, a multidisciplinary kind of way. You know, because um, this is the way in which um, culture and art gets written into uh, so-called official art history, you know, which, you know, uh, then translates into what's taught, what's respected, what's recognized, like who's given a voice in not just the institutions, but the uh, society as a whole, you know. So, I, I mean, and there's a great kind of um, um, useful kind of uh, tension and, and um, and friction uh, between um, the history of, of an institution like the MFA and then the history from outside of that, that realm um, that's now brought in, in inside and um, you know, makes its case for uh, belonging here as much as anything else within you know, the, the vast collection you know, of, of the MFA. Um, and, you know, yeah, because of, um, you know, our designer, Chelsea, is like, there's no way in which it feels like, um, uh, um, you know, and, you know, you know, Liz's choices in terms of placement and 
an installation. Um, I mean, you never feel like you're you're in anything that feels sterile and austere and removed from uh, the context that it's trying to recreate. So I want to move to our questions because I know Liz, you have uh, you're on something of a schedule here, and we do have one that is very appropriate to the image we have up right now which is, um, and this is something we haven't discussed, but one of our uh, viewers asked if one of you could discuss the role that fashion plays in the exhibition, because we do see some, some garments that clearly were turned into artworks. Um, I believe there's, a, there's an out outfit that Madonna wore, um, at least it's in the catalog. Um, so if you can talk about the, the role that fashion played here and how you chose what to include in that area. Yeah. Well, I just want to say, if you go to the film Downtown 81, you see that everybody in there just had incredible style in the era. You know, I mean, they were fashion trendsetters before anybody was thinking about them on, um, even the musicians, you know, was thinking about them on a national or global radar. You know, I mean, it was, um, you know, it's just, it's part of the legacy of being a, a, a bohemian in New York um, in, in any era, is that um, your presentation, is, you know, has got to be tight. It's got to be original and it's got to be uh, individual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we have um, the leather jacket in this image um, of Glenn O'Brien, one of the creators of, of Downtown 81, um, who asked Basquiat to, to star as, as the struggling young artist spray painting on the street and, and beginning to create uh, canvases. So true story, right? Um, and Glenn O'Brien was, of course, um, the creator of TV Party, this this uh, public access television show in which this scene kind of played out in the most absurdist, uh, uh, non-scripted ways. Um, the Madonna suit um, is is this pink one. Um, it was uh, embellished by Ellie Two and Keith Haring uh, for her performance of. Um, like a virgin uh, in a club setting to celebrate Keith's 26th birthday. Um, she really, at this time, you know, she had dated Basquiat. She was fully embedded in this scene um, and she was on the cusp of fame in September of that same year, 84. Um, she stars on the, in the MTV Music Witty Video Awards um, and goes absolutely viral and becomes a national pop star. Um, but at the time of this uh, documentation, um, because we do have her performing in the in the suit um, on this this tube television, um, she was one of the gang. Um, yeah, and then also in terms of fashion, um, you know, there was there was no filter. There was a um, a belief in taking up any available surface. Um, by these artists, which was of course a carryover from graffiti culture. Um, we have several, you know, tagged um, with a leather jacket that introduces the show, tagged by many of the artists in the exhibition, including Jean Michel. Um, you know, as late as 1984, on the occasion of his uh, solo exhibition at Mary Boone opening, um, he was celebrating that together with his friends, and they all tagged up a leather jacket, you know, marking the occasion. Lady Pink has told us stories of, you know, when they would get invited to some um, fancy collector's um, home for a party, they would say, okay, we'll come, like, we'll make the party cool, but as a condition, like, we all get to tag a door in your apartment. Um, so there was this um, impulse to never stop creating collectively. And um, I feel like that is maybe best embodied in the work of Ram LZ. Um, we have a, um, you <laughs> yeah, maybe the most important work that he ever created um, at the center of the uh, final gallery of the show. It's called Gashalier, and it um, it began um, in uh, around 83, 84 um, as a costume um, that he would wear, and it was basically visors and maybe there was a leopard thing. There's a, a depiction of it in a work that I showed earlier um, in its early stages. And then it begins to accumulate, uh, remains a costume and 
is um, in effect what he um, performs in quite often uh, as a rapper. Um, he goes on in history as a, as a rapper, thanks to, in part, thanks to Beat Bop, the track he records with, with Basquiat, um, but his visual art is um, largely ignored until about 2018 although there, um, he did have um, an important spot in Art in the Streets at, at MoCA LA in two, um, 2012. Um, but this costume, Gachelier, is, um, you know, Ramelzy talked about weapons, um, symb letters in wild style writing being symbolic weapons in a battle to take language back from the oppressors. In this costume, which is absolutely fashion, it is ab about style, it's about posture, uh, but it also has like literal <laughs> weapons in it, um, you know. I think you told me at one point there was dynamite <laughs> attached to the thing. There was uh, this staff, very sharp things. There's a machine gun vocoder. And at one time um, it had dynamite that would, um, fire would spurt from its wrists and ankles. Um, so this was uh, a master work by Ramel Z and for me really um, hones in on the idea of the centrality of the body um, to his practice that you could never remove um, his performative presence, um, the, the myth that he created around Gothic futurism and, and his battle to um, seize, to take back language from the oppressors. Um, and it was, um, he was out there for sure, um, but he wasn't wrong about language meaning power and language being power. And he and his fellow um, artists who took over the subway train creating um, a platform for their voices, which was absolutely unprecedented and, and commanding so much control over city space um, in the 70s and into the 80s. And I, I wanted to, um... What, you know, one, one person uh, put a question um, saying, so some of the other artists of color who were around at the same time are part of this exhibition. And I think it probably should be pointed out. I mean, we're taking for granted that everyone knows who's in the exhibition, but I believe the majority of, you know, creators in the exhibition are or were people of color. Um, and, and one thing I, I would ask, which I guess hadn't, I, I hadn't really thought about it until now, is Lady Pink the only woman represented in the exhibition and were there um other women in this in this scene if you will who who were you know working alongside these guys because most of them were guys yeah i mean you, you know lady lady pink is is um was the it was the most uh, recognized um woman artist to move from the trains into the the galleries. I mean, in some ways, um, you know, she's, um, you know, the one and only, you know, she talks about knowing other crews of women who were working on trains uh, at the time, but they didn't make that transition, you know, but the thing is, um, her presence, um, even as uh, the one woman um, in the show um, is, is, uh, is uh, palpable and overwhelming and, and, um, um, inescapable, you know, um, as being, um, you know, one of the definitive creators, you know, of, the, of this moment. And, um, you know, there's the, um, there's the earlier work that Liz showed. And then these, there are two paintings in this, this gallery, um, which um, kind of pairs off her work with uh, some of Jean Michel's work dealing with bodies and, um, and anatomy and, and uh, death and rebirth and so forth. Um, that are actually collaborations with uh, Jenny Holzer, right? Yeah. Yeah, Greg and I have some forthcoming scholarship on this amazing series of, of paintings that um, is little known, but um, Jenny Holzer, to answer your question, Sarah, uh, Lady Pink has said she was absolutely the only other female I knew who went out into the streets and created art because Jenny was of course postering Times Square, you know, coming from more of a, a punk discipline. Um, and she was 14 years Lady Pink's senior um, and recognized the power of, um, of graffiti artists, of the young graffiti artists and of the movement and um, invited 
Lady Pink to create this series of paintings, um, as well as A1, um, another artist in the show, um, to create a series of paintings with her as well. And we have one of those works um, in the Writers Gallery. So we really wanted to give Lady Pink her moment, um, which we do by this gallery. And um, the work in the background, the 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 nude um it's not in the catalog and we only have this pretty crappy photo of it um because it came to us kind of late in the process you know after we had been in um yeah a great deal of conversations with um jean michel's wonderful family that um oversees his estate um they realized that they actually had in their possession a work by lady pink which Jean-Michel purchased for his personal collection out of an exhibition that they were in together in 1983 in a friend's loft. Um, so they offered it kindly on view uh, for, the, for this, this exhibition. And I think that moments like that of solidarity, um, of demonstrating solidarity in the scene, um, also the post graffiti exhibition timeline that we put together that shows how all the artists in the exhibition, including Jean-Michel exhibited together um, for a number of years as part of shows that were really articulating um, this uh, group as a movement. Um, you know, that sort of solidarity and um, bringing everyone together under this one post graffiti um, umbrella was some of what drove um, the scholarship behind the show. Um, I also just wanted to oh. Oh, go ahead, Joanna. Oh, sure. I also just wanted to give a shout out to um, the women um, artists and peers like Jennifer Jazz and Felice Rosser, um, the Lower East Side folks, and um, as well as um, Alexis Adler. There's another exhibition called Basquiat Before Basquiat, and they would they also displayed some of um, the fashion pieces that Basquiat wore uh, created. Um, he made uh, it was called Man Made. Um, and he collaborated with um, Patricia Fields on Bowery. Um, and this is just, this is surely to make everybody on the chat, Jay. Speaking of leather jackets, um, I recently got this tag um, whoops, by Al Diaz, who apparently came by for a visit, says Samo for the Enlightened. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> Great, uh, and we have um, a man-made piece by Basquiat, this white lab coat, um, which yeah, he amazing. series, you know, his abstract, he, he was making abstract expressionist sweatshirts and, and the like, and it was absolutely part of. Oops. Wow, what happened there? I think, I know that she had something at eight. Oops, I can't hear you, Sarah. Uh, I'm not. Oh, oh, oh the, time, the timer took Liz out of the- Yeah, out it's of, funny. Of she, well, unfortunately, everyone who's listening, Liz did say she had a hard stop, but that's the hardest stop I've ever seen. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I that's just want to- That's a techno plug, jerk. Yeah, yeah, I want to plug something in the catalog, just since we're talking about Lady Pink, there's this amazing photograph in the catalog where it's like, and the caption is so understated. It's like Lady Pink with her favored colors. And it's so amazing because it's all these cans of spray paint on the shelves. And what it reminds right. you is that, you know, the you arsenal. Yeah, but you think of artists like Monet as having a palette, and that is something so refined, like this is his palette. And these artists had palettes too, it was just in a different material. And you might call it something, but in fact, that was her palette, you know, and that, and anyhow. I mean, I, I, I mean you know, the thing is, um, you know, as with, um, uh, you know, jazz or R and B. I mean, the thing is, it's it's based in um, a certain um, tradition of, of of Western music. You know, just because of the uh, harmonic system it uses, right? So, in the same way, it's like in a less racist world, we would be seeing these artists as being innovators of a new movement in painting. You know what I mean? Like Colorfield or Abex or so forth. You know what I mean? But um, um, and many of these artists were they were the product of of um, you know, kind of the advanced art education that was available in New York City in the 70s and 80s, you know, early 80s before uh, Reagan kind of uh, stripped um, funding 
you know, for arts and music programs throughout the, yes. the country. Yeah, well, but, um, you know, the, 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 you know, um, you know, except for Basquiat, I mean, these, these artists kind of went through, um, um, you know, these, you know, kind of esteemed um, institutions which were available for, for high schoolers, you know what I mean, in, in New York. Um, so, you know, they're, they're bringing, um, you know, just a certain amount of uh, uh, connection in terms of technique and, and use of, um, um, you know, traditional materials into their innovative um, uh, 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 attack on the <laughs> art, 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 art attack on the, on the train system, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, I mean, you're doing what artists do every generation. They find like, okay, what materials can I use to extend the vision, the expression, you know what I mean? And what's, uh, what's also kind of most efficient um, for um, the fact that I'm, you know, uh, you know for, for us trying to work on uh, a surface that nobody had ever thought about working on before. And, and, and you know, this, I, I'm going to hit you with a question that, you know, whoever takes it is going to have to be brave. But speaking of the, um, the city as, let's say, a, what would you call it, a support, a canvas, um, one of our, uh, one of our audience asks, Many of the urban spaces where these artists worked have transformed significantly since the 70s and 80s. How should we think of graffiti and post graffiti in the context of the massive gentrification happening in NYC and Boston? And, you know, I, I, what I, I would just bring up in this context, the exhibition at the Brandt Foundation of Basquiat, um, more than one critic talked about you know, here's an exhibition that is in a space in Basquiat's old stomping grounds of the East Village, but at the same time represents, and you've written about this, Joanna, the mm -hmm. very gentrification that is changing the city, you know, from, I mean, it's complicated, right? So who wants to join Do you want to take this one on? Um, well, I, I, I recently well, saw a video. New York, right? So I don't know, maybe we should yeah. let Greg do it. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that I I, um, I can't confirm this, but I definitely saw a video of like a bombed out subway very recently. Like, I don't know if this is a, and so I would say that like, even as the, as the city continues to change, especially in this moment of like crisis um, and, um, and as, and, and, and it, it'll be interesting too, to see who stays in New York after COVID, I mean, folks are all like, anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I feel like um, one thing about um, exhibiting Basquiat is the, the majority of, um, of the owners of the works are, it, it's private. So when a Basquiat retro uh, exhibition happens, you need to go see it because you don't, it's like, you might not get a chance to again which seems crazy but like only if only maybe like only a handful of works belong to a museum and i mean yeah. we haven't we haven't gotten into the market here but i'm sure most of the people who are watching this know that a Basquiat sold for a hundred million dollars a few years ago and i remember in 2011 i won't say you know the name of the family but let's say a family that's collected a lot of Basquiat's. one member of this family said to me walking out of an auction house you know, you know, something to the effect of you think this, you know, $10 million result is high. These have sold, you know, privately for $20 million. And that in a way is like, that's a way of perpetuating a market. So Basquiat has become, he, he is, people have built a market from his work. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been part of the conversation for better and mostly worse uh, over the past. Well, I mean, you know, Capitalism is the uh, the economic surround. I think Frederick Jameson called it the untranscendable horizon of activities that define modern life. And if you're looking at real estate, of course, you're talking about the long game. You know, so the people, you know, there, there's only like a few uh, families that own most of the real estate in Manhattan. But you know, as say um, um, fashion manufacturing, you know, left uh, downtown, New, you know, Manhattan. And those spaces became emptied out. Who moved in uh, uh, to to take advantage of um, of an opportunity 
um, to, to, to live an artistic life, to develop work. But it was like jazz musicians, you know, and painters and photographers. So, you know, you know, by the mid seventies, those were the people who were, you know, in the, um, you know, in downtown and the fashion district, you know, kind of taking over these huge, huge lofts to practice and do gigs and so forth. And of course, you know, you know, inadvertently they become the advanced troops for these realtors because they're moving them into scary places of the city, like Alphabet City, where, um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get, um, you know, I'll get, you know, kind of real vernacular with stuff now, but uh, you know, I had a friend that um, he used to, he said, yeah, my, I used to buy dope for Johnny Rotten, you know, and he would get the money, give me the money on Avenue A, and I would go buy it on Avenue D, because he said, he said, at that point in time, he said, if you were white on Avenue A, you were adventurous. If you were on Avenue B, you were brave. C, you were crazy, and D, you were dead. Right. Well, Greg, I know more about this than we have to have a conversation. I know where the needle exchange was. So I was around yeah, yeah. the East Village at that time. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, you know, it, it's, like, you know, if you, you know, you, you talk about downtown, low 14th Street, Canal Street, you know, these are places the bourgeoisie were afraid to go or be, you know, out late at night. But of course, this was, a, this was, you know, the, um, the setting. You know what I mean? This was this was like the real estate that provided the opportunity for um, this amazing nightlife and exchange of cultures that went on between, you know, young folks who were coming out of art school and coming out of the Bronx and Brooklyn and places like the Roxy and the Mud Club and and so forth. So so the net effect of that, and particularly as somebody like like uh, Basquiat, um, um, kind of blows up in the world, is that the realtors now can start showing the you know these works to wall street bankers and you know financiers and other folks who are coming in you know with that kind of and you know and suddenly you know uh uh a loft that uh an, an artist might have been paying a hundred dollars you know uh a month for you know in some old manufacturing building you know um is now like you know going for seven figures um the, i think the last question i want to read from the from the q a because it gets at something that i think we've been taking for granted that people understand um is the idea of post graffiti because one of the people in the q a asks you mentioned that sharing the street art um into the museum space is fitting because museums are the form where art gains respect and posterity would you say that at the time this art was created, the artist had a vision for it to be a, in a formal gallery? And I think this just gets to the heart of graffiti versus post graffiti. And if one of you wants to just lay that out, that would be excellent. I'm, I'm happy to. Sorry for my ungraceful exit a moment ago. It was like the, the power went out at the block party or something. Um, <laughs> so, so in terms of, um, the term post graffiti, you know, um, Fat Five Freddy, who was really um, the conceptual driver of this movement, you know, bringing people together and saying, hey, we should have a piece of this art world. Um, he toyed with different names um, like calligraphy, like calligraphy um, and, and other terms that just didn't stick. Um, but um, that move on that transition onto canvas was very conscious on their part. You know, they realized that um, it was getting increasingly difficult to work in um, the subway contact uh, context um, for policing reasons, for the MBA's um, consistent um, attacks on them and, and erasure of their, their work that were becoming systematic and, um, you know, at a time of, 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 of bankruptcy for the, the city, you know, they, they spend a total into the 80s of $200 million on um, this effort to erase uh, graffiti from the, the subway system. Um, so when the artists, um, you know, they've grown up a bit, they're professionalizing that when they transition their work onto more stable supports, uh, it's with every intention of, of moving into the gallery system. Um, and creating um, a new space uh, for their art, one uh, for which they could get paid um, and uh, one where they could reach audiences that um, they certainly uh, believe that they deserve the attention of. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, you know, with, with, with uh, John Michelle, I mean, it has to be said that he was always shooting, you know, like 
swing swinging for the Raptors. I mean, it was always his intention to to become like um, uh, lionized and and valorized as, as and one we, of the iconic one never, name one name artists. And we haven't touched on the relationship with Warhol, which doesn't really have a place in this exhibition, but which speaks to what you're saying, Greg. And he he was aware of who was who in in that realm, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean, he was aware of of of, of um, the power of, of museums as institutions to to uh, inscribe people in art history. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So um, he and he always the thing is. He had, you know, kind of the um, the audacity and the conviction and the confidence to believe that um, he not only belonged in in the galleries, but you know, in the art history books alongside everybody that people are taught taught about um, in in academic art history classes. Yeah, and the other thing was, you know, very much needing to develop an audience for their work beyond New York City, where they were they were absolutely being scorned, and even though they were, had transitioned their work into completely legal context and legal formats, they were still getting called graffiti artists and it was being called not art. So it, when they transitioned onto canvas, you know, they're able to exhibit in, in Rome, in Europe, where their work is purchased not just by private collectors, but by, by institutions, by museums there. Um, and Grandma Z has said, you know, just like the jazz musician, um, we had to go abroad for our, our, our art to be appreciated and taken seriously. And in fact, in fact, Basquiat's dealer was Bruno Bischofberger, who was in Switzerland. So I think that, you know, the fact that there, there was that involvement, though, I think he got there via Warhol, but it speaks to the, the aspect of the European aspect, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, you know, it, it, it has to be said that if we look at the the history of, of Basquiat's uh, relationship uh, while he was alive and and uh, and in terms of his his uh, his afterlife, mm -hmm. um, um, you know the um, New York Times and and MoMA, you know, are are still very can be can be considered can can be considered still kind of anti Basquiat mm -hmm. in terms of the, of their thinking and the way in which um, he was written about all the way up until. Um, the, um, the the Japanese uh, hip hop uh, hip hop fashion entrepreneur um, you know bought that painting for um, 110 100, was 110 million dollars yeah mm -hmm. um, you know because um, that was that the article that came out about that in the Times was the one that really provided a, um, a kind of indictment of of MoMA in particular in terms of their uh, the way they had uh, denied him access you know, um, uh, to their institutional uh, embrace. Yeah. Well, well I, I have to plug art news here. We ran a long article by Bob Nickus and I think 2015 about how, you know, war, MoMA not having a Basquiat and then not being able to get one, you know. And, and not really being ex able to explain <laughs> why they didn't have one either. You That's know, right. In any kind of coherent fashion, yeah. Well, I think we have to wrap up. I, I know, Liz, you had a you had a hard stop. I'm sorry that we we kind of went right past it. Um, you got yanked out of the matrix, though. <laughs> it's fine. I'm back. <laughs> you, you switched planets. Come, uh, come, on, come, come back, Neo. Come back. Yeah, you just had to go to a different planet. That was your hard stop. Um, we didn't even do a rolling stop. But anyhow, um, I want to thank- We didn't even talk about Afrofuturism. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to encourage everyone to get this catalog. Wow. It's amazing. That's I know right. it's a pale shadow of the experience of being in the exhibition, but there's a lot of great writing in there. There's a lot of great um, images and you can uh, read it while listening to the Spotify and then kind of immerse yourself and imagine that you're there. Maybe eventually you could do a virtual reality sort of catalog. There's also your website, which has a lot of great resources. So I would point people in that yeah. direction as well. Yes, there, there is, uh, we, ha we have um, two exhibition web pages on mfa.org dedicated to this show. And I also want to say that, um, you know, we decided, um, sadly, not to travel the exhibition to the Paris Art Museum Miami, where it was originally supposed to go in order to have it 
for uh, what is effectively a very long run um, on the East Coast. So the show is open until May 16th, 2021. Um, tickets are released in four week blocks um, and they sell out pretty fast. Um, and I would say if you, you haven't ventured out into the art viewing context in, in New York City or, or elsewhere, um, it feels pretty safe at the MFA. Um, I think very safe. Um, we did make a number of adjustments to the exhibition design to open things up. We made available a very long video that people kind of would have gathered around. Um, we made that available on online. It's called Graffiti Post Graffiti. It's a, a 30 minute long documentary. So check that out from home and, and um, get tickets to come see the show. Yeah, and uh, as someone who's taken Amtrak up a, a few times now um, to, to see the exhibition and to, to do some uh, promotion for the show, I can say um, you, there's never been a safer time <laughs> in the history of Amtrak to travel because you're generally in a car with only about six other people. You know what I mean? So there's some serious distancing going on there. So, um, yeah. And if I could just do a quick plug to, um, there's also an exhibition um, happening right now at, um, oh, sorry, in uh, Queens, put the, uh, the, um, the link there. Um, one of the questions, uh, one of the first questions was thinking about artists who have sort of inherited Basquiat's legacy. And there's this incredible um, pioneering Aboriginal Australian artist by the name of Gordon Bennett. And he has an entire series that spans a decade called Notes de Basquiat. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, just even making the connection between the Atlantic and the Pacific and the, um, and the struggles between indigenous people and um, Afro-Atlantic diasporic people, um, I just felt, feel like the conversation is so brilliant. Um, so I just wanna encourage folks to also check him out, um, Gordon Bennett. And if you wanna see his art, whoop. <laughs> So um, anyway, but thank you again, everybody, for, for, for hanging out tonight. Yeah. And for thank us. you, thank you Sarah, Sarah, for doing a great job moderating. Thank you. Sarah, you're yeah. welcome. And thank you for everyone who showed up. And I'm sorry for the questions we, we didn't get to. And um, I would just say thank you for bringing that up, Joanna. Um, the, the, but the, the thing I would say about, and we talked about this before the panel, you know, one of the things this show I think is really emphasizing is that Basquiat worked in so many different mediums and that mm -hmm. it is it is in some ways hard to think about someone who is, you know, functioning in the pop culture, you know, realm or in the art realm who is not influenced by Basquiat in some way. Um, and so I think that's something to, to think about as we say goodbye. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, National Arts Club, Greg, Joe. Have a great night. Bye. All right. Night, everybody. Bye.